Welcome to the 80th episode of Split Focus, a film and TV podcast. My name is Simon Eady, and alongside me, I have my co-host and the Remember All superfan, Adrian Pinter. How does it go, sir? General Kenobi. It goes quite well. How are you, Simon Eady, today? I am doing okay. These are dark times, Adrian. These are dark times. Yeah, I know. My uh, Cuba trip got canceled. C- Cuba? Yeah, Cuba. As they pronounce it there in the in communist Cuba. Why do you need to pronounce it like that? Because I was I was preparing for going there, Simon. Now I'm not going there anymore. I was prepping. You were preparing to go there just by saying that one word like that in that yeah. accent? Yeah. Por favor, dude. Okay. I'm sorry that it got canceled because of Omicron. Yeah, whatever. Life goes on. Nothing can get me down except for that, which really got me down yesterday when I heard the news. But it's okay. It's another day. The sun was shining today. Not all that bright, and it was very cold, but hey, you know, that's life. I'll go later this year. You know what I mean, man? It's a bummer. I was so close, but alas, poor York. I knew him well. I uh, I am not going anymore, and uh, yeah, it, it's a bummer, but whatever, uh, which means that uh, we don't have to, you know, bright side everything, Simon. We, do, we don't have to record any special episodes for this podcast. We can just keep the, the boat rowing, as they say. You know what I mean? Right. Indeed. The boat continues to row. Yeah. We have done now, this is the 80th episode in a row, week on week. Haven't missed a week. That we have done. We have never missed any weeks, which is pretty cool, I think. I agree with you. I think it's super cool. Got a pretty good streak going. Mm-hmm. An 80-week streak, I think. Indeed. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly that. Nice. Adrian, Ben Affleck, or Ben Affleck, as Snoop Dogg would say. Yes. Had a little uh, had a little talk with the Herald Sun. Did you see that? Um, I didn't read it, but I heard about it, um, like through like headlines. Um, yeah, I saw it from like the, I think I saw it first on IGN, like mm-hmm. that, uh, entertainment website. Sorry, Ken, for bringing up IGN. IGN talks about movies and uh, TV shows as well, Adrian. It's not just video games. Oh, I know. He just used that as a jab, Simon, many episodes ago. If you don't recall, he called us IGN for talking about video games. So just wanted to apologize. Well, maybe he should have called us GameSpot because they've got a, a larger catalog than that. Okay. That's true. That's true. He should have. Yeah. You should tell Ken that tomorrow. I just told him. Oh, that's true. He listens to this podcast every week. He's our number one fan, I think. He's my number one fan. And our number one collaborator and number one writer in her. I'm I'm his number one fan. Yeah. But Adrian, Ben Affleck mm-hmm. uh, said. Batfleck. Uh, or Batfleck, aka Batfleck. He said basically to Harold's son that that the um sounds like I'm saying Harold Harold's son or something like that. Yeah, he, he said it to Harold's son. <laughs> Harold's son, no, some newspaper. Uh, Harold's son. I, I, I'll get to I'll get to the point eventually. Don't worry. I know he basically said that this is the last time he's going to play Batman. He's in the Flash, mm-hmm. which is interesting because Michael Keaton is not is actually going to continue his role as Batman mm-hmm. in the Batgirl uh, film after the Flash. But he also said that, I'm just going to quote it here, quote, I have never said this, this is hot off the presses, but maybe my favorite scenes in terms of Batman and the interpretation of Batman that I have ever done are in the Flash movie. Wow. I hope they maintain the integrity of what we did because I thought it was great and really interesting. Different, but not in a way that is incongruent with the character, unquote. Mm. I'm excited. Me three. I'm very excited. Color me excited. I'll color you excited, man. I'll color you from head to toe in excitement. Why do I feel like that? That was, that was somehow sexual, Adrian. I don't know, man. You're putting that in there. I think you did that. I'm pretty sure you did that, and you did it intentionally. I don't think so. I just called you. I just said I was going to color you from head to toe in excitement. And now you did a weird. See, now that was sexual. Now that was sexual. Like the way I said that one, but the first time was not. You know what I mean? I think the first time was as well because I don't think you intended to do it the second time, but it's just it started to you know become more sexual as it went. Mm. I I think that it was intended to be sexual. Anyway, regardless, do you hear a saxophone in the background? No, things are getting tense, baby. Is there a saxophone? 
No, there isn't. Epic Sax guy? Yeah. Are you around? Hello? Remember that guy? He would like go into like random like university classrooms just playing his saxophone. Did he actually go to random university classrooms? Because I don't recall that part. Yeah, he would like walk into like lectures and stuff and just start playing. He's the sexy sax man or whatever. Huh. But it, it was the sound of a saxophone instead of me doing those noises. That's not epic sax guy. That's a different guy though. Are you? That's sexy sax man. Oh, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Epic sax guy. Yeah. Epic sax guy into the Google. Oh, he's a Moldovan musician, Sergey Igorovich Stepanov. I'm unsure if that's the connection that I was trying to make, but regardless, mm-hmm. audience that knows, uh, you know, knows the memes out there better than Adrian. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. There's this guy, um, he like posts things on the TikTok, um, which I'm not usually on often, but I, I saw it on the Instagram. The TikTok? Yeah, the TikTok. Oh, okay, Grandpa. And his name is uh, Karsten Belt, and he adds like saxophone solos to like random songs. He literally just, re- uh, so like there's there's that, that Olivia Rodrigo song. Um, I don't know, it was on the radio, I forget what it's called. Good for you, good for you, that song, which is a bop on its own, honestly, I, I like that song. But uh, this dude, he adds like a crazy sax solo in the song, and it's like, ooh, it's a good song right there. But if you just look up sax solo Olivia Rodrigo, it's the first video that pops up. I highly recommend checking it out on the topic of saxophone, Simon. All right, Adrian, Like, are you going to comment on the Ben Affleck thing? Because, I mean, I'm still waiting here. Oh, I forgot we were talking about that. Um, yeah, this is a. Uh, I mean, it, it it both excites me and saddens me, Simon. I I really like Ben Affleck as Batman. I think Batman v Superman is a great movie, and I think he does a great job portraying Batman in that movie as well as in the uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League. So seeing him kind of you know go away and it, it's a bummer, but I'm excited to see what his role is going to be in that movie. And if Ben Affleck thinks that this is the best representation of Batman that he's portrayed, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm all, I'm all in baby. I'm all in this flash movie. Uh, seems like it's going to be a very fun time. And I don't know. I'm kind of excited to see where the DCEU goes from here because they're very clearly using this movie as almost like a soft reboot to the universe. You keep saying that's very clear, but I don't think anything is clear until we actually see it. Let's just say that. No. Because they haven't really made... I'm going to stand by what I said. But they haven't made any good moves in a long time in terms of their universe, in terms of like trying to bring things together and glue things together. Well, I think that's what the Flash movie is is trying to do, Simon. But no one said that explicitly, unless I'm mistaken. I don't know if you are. I don't think I am. But you might be. You just keep saying that. You're yeah. the one saying it, but you don't like work for them. You don't even work in this industry. We're, we're just, I'm in the industry. I'm deep in the industry, Simon. We're just a bunch of fans here. Let's be honest. Speak for yourself. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah who's your connection in the industry? Martin Scorsese. Yeah. Yeah. How are you related to Martin Scorsese? He's actually my dad, believe it or not. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's incredible. Yeah. I swear I've met your dad before. Mm-hmm. So. He doesn't look exactly like Martin Scorsese. My dad says hi, by the way. Kind of different. Not just to you, but to everyone. <laughs> he wanted me to say that. Are you talking about your real dad or the fake dad you just created? <laughs> My real dad. Oh, so not Martin Scorsese. Good to know. Wait, did he actually say hi to me? Yeah, my, my dad just said to say hi. <laughs> right like, now? No, not now. He like told me like, I don't know, like a few days ago. Like, Is sit. he in the room? Get, it, get him in here. Get him in here. Get him on, get him on the air. Well, he's sleeping. He's an old man. What time is it? 9.30. <laughs> yeah, it's not that late. But okay. It is for him. God, he's like he's like 80 years old or something. Okay. This is a very convoluted ep- beginning of the episode so far. You've gone off off the rails 55 times. I'm trying to reel you back in. This is kind of a, a bit of a struggle. Ooh. What are you going oh, for? Just <laughs> pay attention, okay? Pay attention to the damn script a little bit. Just a tiny little bit. Adrian, do you have any show corrections from last week? I'm curious. I do indeed, Simon. I do have okay. a few so- show corrections uh, for mistakes we made because, as you know, my mistakes are your mistakes, your mistakes are my mistakes. And yeah, uh, I'm reading them here, and it sounds like there are a lot of your mistake, but uh, go on. Which are your mistakes because they're my mistakes. God, you never get it. Just get it through that thick skull of yours, man. <laughs> um, but uh, I missed two movies uh, in the new releases last week. I don't know how. Actually, never mind. I know one of them. So The Tender Bar. Um, it released on Amazon Prime Video on the seventh, which is uh, yesterday, which is a Friday. Yesterday, as of uh, as of when we are recording this, um, and the reason I miss this, Simon, is because on Movie Insider, 
the hit website that I used for the sources of when movies releasing, it showed that it was releasing on the 17th. So someone like did a little, little mix up. So, uh, not to shift blame on anyone, but it's all movie insiders fault. And I shouldn't be held accountable for this. Yeah. Now the other movie that I missed is a movie called the, Th- the three, five, five. And again, this movie's coming to theaters. And this was on Movie Insider, so I can't blame them there. But it wasn't on the Cineplex app, which is usually what I use for movies coming out to theaters. Anyways, that one I blame Cineplex for. So uh, long story short, we didn't make any mistakes. It was uh, Movie Insider and Cineplex's fault, respectively. Yeah, you made mistakes. Um, and that's uh, that's that. Um, also, I feel like maybe you corrected this and said the exact number last week. But just to clarify, Disney Plus in Canada used to be $9 a month or $90 a year. It's now gone up to, uh, what is it, 12 bucks? I'm not, you actually pay for it. I don't. You'd think you would know this part if you're going to correct it on the episode. Well, hey, man, I don't. So is it 12 bucks? I don't remember exactly. That's why I kind of said it vaguely, but I did say what it was before. I think I said that part. But now we're going to say, what, an incorrect number, and then you're going to correct it again next week or what? Yeah, and then we'll just keep on flip-flopping back and forth. Right. Mm. Yeah, it's very efficient. Yeah, it's 12 bucks. It's $12. Disney plus Canada or $120 a year. Yeah. It's 1199, 1199 a month, 12, 1200 a year. No. Yeah. That makes sense. The math checks out. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Okay, cool. Adrian, somebody wrote into us. Did you know that? I did actually. Oh, how'd you know? Anyway, it's on the dock. Let's reach into the mailbag for a moment here. Shall we? We ask our listeners to write into us with comments and questions and corrections or anything else by way of Twitter or by email to spillfocuspodcast at gmail.com. And longtime listener Kenneth Stadabauer wrote into us once again, and he said, Film peeps, I'm curious if either of you gentlemen have been following the book of Boba Fett. Personally, I'm loving it. There's a lot of fan service, like a recreation of Macquarie art for A New Hope. But like The Mandalorian, it is subtle in its presentation, unlike Rise of Skywalker, in which fan service was the obvious glue to its nonsensical plot. It's a bad movie. It's a bad movie. Rise of Skywalker sucks. The only major complaint that I've seen about The Book of Boba Fett is from IGN, stating that it has a similarity in plot to Dune. Dune. While true, both seem to be influenced by the real-life adventures of Colonel T.E. Lawrence. On that note, if you are interested in a classic movie to review, I recommend Lawrence of Arabia from 1962. It's a compelling story with absolutely stunning visuals this email of course is signed by kenneth and he's got a quote here actually two quotes two the first is these people lay ancestral claim to the dune sea and if you are to pass a toll is to be paid to them a quote by boba fett himself wow and a second quote here men have looked upon the desert as barren land the freeholding of whoever chose but in fact each hill and valley in it had a man who was its acknowledged owner and would quickly assert the right of his family or clan to it against aggression. A quote from character T.E. Lawrence. Adrian, first off, have you watched Lawrence of Arabia, Adrian, from 1962? Academy Award winning movie? No, I've never... Best Picture uh, winning I, movie? No, I... Um, uh, no. Okay. Lawrence of Arabia? No, I've never watched it. No, I like how you... You squeezed that in there. Well done. It's very fast. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'm quick. Watcha. Just like the Flash movie. Not the character, but the movie. The movie's going to be very fast. Uh, actually, it hasn't been fast at all. It hasn't, been, hasn't it been delayed? I feel like we've been waiting for this movie for many years. I don't know, man. I genuinely don't know. You're probably right. Yeah, I think, I think there was like Flash movies teased, I think, after like Green Lantern with Ryan Reynolds. I, I swear that was a thing. Oof, probably. Yeah. Remember when like DC did the whole? Anyways, I don't, I don't want to go off on that tangent. Um, Lawrence of the uh, of Arabia. Uh, no, I've never watched it. However, my good pal Corey really loves that movie. It's one of his favorites, and he's recommended it to me before. So it's been on my list for a while. Uh, I'm just never gotten around to it. Simon, have you seen this movie, Lawrence of Arabia? I have released actually. in 1962. Oh, you're trying, to say, one, you're trying to do what I was doing, but I'm still talking, so it didn't actually work because you didn't quite get the timing right. So, alas. I win. What are you doing? Are you slurping a drink during the podcast? Uh, What is that? A a Slurpee from 7-Eleven or some shit? What are you doing? Who won now? Who won now? Okay. 
That was just rude. Neither of us. Neither of us won. I was just sneaking in there just before you said anything and you couldn't speak. It was masterful. This is some bullshit. Anyway, regardless. <laughs> oh, masterful. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. I actually did see it years ago when I was a kid. I was a, tr- a small child and I have like fond nostalgic memories of watching it in my living room. Like my, my family are like, uh, you know, my childhood home family room. And mm-hmm. we watched on like the CRT, like tube TV and – my mom was there. My brother was there. And honestly, I don't remember very much at all of it. And that's a kind of a – it's a weird thing because I remember watching it and I remember some of the stunning visuals. But again, I was watching it on like a CRT TV. So I feel like I don't have that much of a perspective, especially now. I do remember Peter O'Toole was in it and uh, Alec Guinness. Uh, what? Which is a, you know, a good connection because of Tatooine here with Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, it's, that's something. Other than that, again, just the the family room of my childhood home, and I feel like I wasn't paying attention because I don't know what the plot is. I really don't. So maybe I should watch it again yeah. because it is, uh, again, award-winning masterpiece of a film that many think is actually the greatest movie of all time. Yeah. Um, probably better than Citizen Kane. I don't like that movie. Yeah, it seems like Ken likes this movie better than Citizen Kane as well based on how he's talking about it here, mm-hmm. considering you guys both don't like Citizen Kane, which I find a little strange. But anyway... Regardless, are you still watching Boba like the book of Boba Fett? Like, are you on episode? Did you finish episode two this week? No, I didn't actually. I, I I'll be honest. I forgot that it came out. Oh, yeah, just one of those like just left my mind. I was off all day Wednesday as well. I probably could have watched it, but uh, I was busy watching another television series, Simon. Oh, so yeah. interesting. Did you watch it? Did you end up uh, jumping in, or are you are you just gonna wait it out like you said that you might do last week? I've so far waited it out. That's what I'll say. And uh, I'm sorry to Ken because we don't have as much to talk about in regards to this. But I thought you for sure would watch it, so I thought at least you could comment on it. But yeah. I, I really like that first episode. Again, I, I think what they're doing is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I legitimately just forgot that it existed. Mm. So I see. Yeah. Okay then. That's showbiz, baby. Thanks, Kenneth, for writing into us. I appreciate it as usual. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. I love you. What else have you been watching then? You obviously weren't watching Book of Boba Fett. So what did you watch this week, Adrian? Ooh, Simon. Um, well, I finished uh, Avenue 5, but I'm not going to talk about it much other than uh, just saying uh, I really love this show. It's it's awesome, and it has a really funny finish, and I'm very excited for the second season, which should be releasing this year. But uh, that's the HBO show where a s- space cruise goes awry, and uh, great cast – absolutely hilarious there's there's one line in particular especially like in that last episode where i just laughed out loud um and uh yeah great show i highly recommend it. avenue five on hbo you can watch it on crave here in canada but simon most of my week i watched uh cobra kai season four it released on netflix on um I think like New Year's Eve. I think it was December 31st. Ah, yes. The G.I. Joe spinoff series on Amazon Prime. Yes, Simon. Except it's not. It's it's a spinoff of the Karate Kid movies. Oh, shit. On yeah. YouTube Premium. It was on YouTube Premium. So this show, um, Cobra Kai, uh, originally started on YouTube. And the first two seasons aired on YouTube Red. Um, and then... Following uh, YouTube Red's closure, YouTube just kind of backing out of the streaming game almost entirely, Netflix ended up picking it up, which was uh, a good choice by Netflix. And they released season three, which I thought was pretty great. And then uh, season four is also really, really good, too. And um, again, it just uh, continues the story of the Karate Kid movies just set like 30 whatever years later. You know, um, Ralph Macchio is an old man. All of that. He's not really an old man. He's just like a, you know, like probably in his 40s, 50s. Um, and it just kind of uh, goes from there. But it actually follows Johnny Lawrence, which was the antagonist of the first movie. He's made to be the main character, um, at least at the beginning. And, you know, obviously they add additional characters. And it's just about Johnny Lawrence reopening Cobra Kai um, in season one. And, uh, you know, uh, Danny uh, Russo um, is all like, what the fuck? You can't do this. And then uh, reopens his Miyagi-Do and, you know, um, they, they continuously butt heads. But season four, um, a lot of time has passed, you know, three seasons prior. Their relationship is, you know, a lot better than it was in the first season, all that good stuff. And uh, this show is an anime um, just made into live action with huh? over the top, r- ridiculous characters, these awkward sort of um, 
like monologues that these characters make and you know people betraying each other and stuff hold on so you're saying it's terrible no how dare you take that back what what do you mean name a good anime live action adaptation i can't think of one i'm not saying this is an adaptation it just feels like a live action anime just think about what the connotation of that is because there's so many netflix adaptations that have just been completely like people to hate them so much like what did we even announce that but the um Cowboy, Cowboy Bebop, Bebop. canceled. Yeah, it was canceled. Yeah, we talked about that briefly. So, um, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm saying, no, I'm saying how that's not necessarily a great descriptor. Is this show good? Well, it's not an adaptation, son. Yeah, it's good. That's what I'm getting at. It's it's, it's really good. It's just like this over the top anime like sort of story arc with these characters, just like you know, just beating the shit out of each other. These over the top like karate fight scenes. Um, and uh, honestly, yeah, the show's really great. It's funny. The ac- the actual like action is surprisingly great and i'm pretty sure that the kids in it are doing their own stunts i i didn't look it up but honestly it seems like they are um and it makes things just really fun so the actors just so happen to know martial arts uh i imagine they like trained for it over time hmm. you know it's been like five six years since they started and they I just see. kept on learning it as they progressed okay but it, 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 it's it's good this season has like a tournament essentially to be fair most of the seasons end with a tournament but this one just felt way more like a like a build up and there's you know multiple karate dojos like facing off against each other and everything and um yeah again it's just all around enjoyable i like the characters i like you know uh they bring back a lot of the characters from the um like the movies. So not just like uh, Danny Russo and, and Johnny Lawrence, but um, other characters that, you know, appear even in the first karate kid, but especially like karate kid two and three that I just never expected uh, them to bring in because honestly, those two movies aren't really that great or well-regarded, especially the third one. Um, but it's nice that they're honoring that and kind of retroactively making those movies better in a way, um, which I really appreciate. Um, the one thing I don't like about Cobra Kai um which again kind of uh, annoys me a little bit is that every single kid is an absolute prick. Like everyone goes through these phases where, you know, like they're down, they're down and out. And then, you know, they become like top dog and then they just become total assholes. And it's like this constant cycle of, uh, of these like children just being total fucking assholes to one another. Um, And honestly, it's like, I can't think of a single like, character that doesn't go th- i mean there's there's a couple i guess but most of the main characters the main cast goes goes through like a cycle of you know being down and out and then like becoming more powerful and then becoming a total asshole and then they get knocked down again and it's like this constantly going cycle hmm. um and just a bunch of ridiculous scenarios going on and arguably the most ridiculous thing in that in like season four especially is one of the kids calls gatorade by its actual flavor calls it like glacial freeze instead of just the color and it's like what <laughs> Like, yeah. who does that nobody literally nobody does that and that was arguably the most ridiculous thing that happened in the show um but i really like it uh i i binge watched it uh within the week obviously and um i'm excited for season five i'm i'm curious to see what route they're gonna take the show uh because they always end each season with a big cliffhanger um that kind of sets up the next season and uh yeah i really like the show i i think it's definitely worth watching Um, Even if you're just kind of a Karate Kid fan, like I I watched the movies when I was a lot younger. I have a decent amount of nostalgia for it, but they've never been like one of my favorite movies by any stretch of the imagination. Um, But again, I really like the show. I think it's really fun. Excellent. And it's, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Egg salad. Yeah, that's really. Very good. uh, Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Egg salad. I really like egg salad as well. Egg salad. No. Sorry, we're talking about egg salad? I think, I I swear to God, you said that. I said excellent. Excellent? Oh. You know the word? Describe things that are amazing. Never heard of it. I'm a little bit hungry, but whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Some kind of miscommunication. Anyways, Adrian, what else did you watch this week? I think I know the answer because we might have gone there together, but (laughs) but yeah. You did, Simon. We watched a double Bradley feature Cooper. A double? Or a double Bradley Cooper feature. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do that one. Uh, so we watched a double Bradley Cooper feature. Mm. Um, so we went to the Princess Cinemas in Waterloo, a nice little indie theater, um, the longest running theater in the Kitchener Waterloo area, according to them, um, their email list that I get sent every once in a while. Yes. And um, yeah, we watched uh, both Nightmare Alley and Licorice Pizza. 
And Bradley Cooper's in both of those movies. Or as you call it, the Carice pizza. The Carice pizza. House of Gucky and the Carice pizza. Mm-hmm, exactly. We didn't watch House of Gucci, just to be clear. That was many weeks ago. Good movie. I really like that movie, actually. Yes. Uh, but anyways, uh, which of these movies do you want to talk about first, Simon? Uh, we can go in chronological order. Uh, just to be clear, okay. let's just start off with a little preface here. We went to these movies as a double feature because we knew that the next day, January the 5th, that uh, you know there might be a little shutdown. So we decided... Close and close. It's a good idea to go watch uh, a couple movies before that happened. Um, after that announcement had been made. So we went to go to Princess Twin, which is like a more of an independent theater and is probably what hurt the most. So we went to watch... Actually, these two movies we also coincidentally also wanted to watch mm -hmm. um, as well anyway. So it worked out. But anyways, we, the first movie we saw was Nightmare Alley. And um, it's basically a film, uh, of course, by Guillermo del Toro. I think it's a... I think the last feature he made was Shape of Water. So I think it's the next movie after mm -hmm. that like, in terms of movies he's he's created but released he's released and shape of water won best picture so i feel like you know i was thinking whoa what's what's this movie gonna be is it gonna be a best picture winner again possibly it might be maybe i really liked it to be quite honest it follows bradley mm. cooper as the main character he basically goes to this uh he's like this kind of drifter goes to a circus a carnival of sorts and becomes mm. a carny and there's lots of crazy characters that he he meets along the way, I would just say. Willem Dafoe mm -hmm. stars in it. We've got David Strathairn. Rooney Mara. Yeah. Kate Blanchett's in it as well. Tony Collette. Yeah. Tony Collette. Everyone's favorite dream horse. And um, Ron Perlman as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, incredible performances from pretty much everybody. And the style of this movie is really good. Um, what did you think of it? Like, what's your what's your take on this film? Um, I think this movie is really good. And I think one of the things I really loved about this movie uh, is not necessarily the movie itself. It's the trailers, because the trailers are so phenomenal. That made me like so intrigued to watch this movie, yet didn't reveal anything. Yeah. I still felt like I was going into this movie blind, even though I've watched all the trailers. Yeah, that's what I feel like too, but only I feel like more so after watching the movie and that it takes you on this, mm. it, I feel like an intricate journey that I didn't think it was going to happen. No. And uh, it surprised me quite a bit because the trailers were kind of vague. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Like the, the, the trailers don't really reveal anything, anyone's like intentions, any characters, like motives or whatever. And I feel like this movie is very distinctly separated into like almost two acts, I would say. Um, and once it got into the second act, I was like, quite like, oh, wow, I, I did not expect this movie to go in this direction. And um, like you said, the performances from everyone is, uh, or, yeah, is, is just fantastic. Um, I think Bradley Cooper just he's a really great actor. And I've known this for a while, especially after um, uh, A Star is Born, um, where, again, that was probably my one of my favorite movies of that year, if not my favorite movie of that year. And yeah. And is, The Hangover is, Part Two, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that as well. Oh, such a good movie. I've actually never watched Hangover Part 2 or 3. I've never seen any of them. I was just saying that because uh, I feel like that if there was going to be a performance that he made, it might not have been his best ones in yeah. those movies. But that's actually not maybe even possible. I thought you were going to say, oh, he's actually really good in that. But you haven't even seen it. So never mind. Yeah, he's got in the first one. I like the first one. That's a comedy. You know, different different type of movie. It's a good movie. But uh, yeah, I, I think his uh, his character in this is incredibly interesting in the way – like this movie kind of unfolds is stellar. I think one of the things this movie does incredibly well is the cinematography and the use of lighting. Mm, um, yes. That's one thing I was paying attention to a lot of the time where, you know, characters will walk onto the screen and there'll be almost like a ray of light shining through the window that only illuminates their eyes and little things like that, which I just yeah. freaking adored. Um, yeah, honestly, I, I this this movie was a was a was a ride that I just didn't expect to enjoy so much. Um, but yeah, man, I, I don't know. I, I really love this movie. It, it's it's hard to talk about it because I don't I don't want to dive into any like the plot points or story story points because again the trailers did just, just such a good job hiding all of that information while still making it intriguing. And uh, I really recommend people go out and watch this movie if you can, obviously. True that. The the number one thing I had to say about it too was the lighting. Like I feel like the lighting design overall was just really good. And then mixing the cinematography with it. It's shown in the trailer how good the lighting is, I think, 
but it's just done so well the whole time. It just uh, that that kind of 1930s, like late, late 1930s, early 1940s aesthetic uh, with mm-hmm. like the carnival kind of concept. There's something about that aesthetic that's like deeply haunting to me. I, I don't know. There's um, I don't know if this is like a weird reference, but I don't know if you ever uh, read uh, the like the series of unfortunate events books. Uh, no, I never read any of it. There's like one one specific book that takes place at a at a carnival as well, and like the way it's drawn and stuff like that. And I know that was taken arguably from other places too, but that style of that 1930s carnival. There's something very creepy about it distinctly and Guillermo del Toro just captures that like just like in a bottle in this movie and it's so well again shot and the costume design is so good and just Willem Dafoe is acting oh man Willem Dafoe can just do anything really Mm -hmm. and I just think that he's kind of perfect as like this uh like this head of this carnival which is introduced right in the beginning of the movie and I think in the trailer honestly but I just think that he does such a good job oh man just uh, the way his voice, he's, he kind of manipulates his voice to do this kind of almost like that step right up, step right up type type mm-hmm. voice, if you know what I'm saying, for that kind of era. Uh, man. Yeah, definitely. It's awesome. And uh, it's a really brilliant score by Nathan Johnson, who I, I just mm-hmm. recently learned is Ryan Johnson's cousin, who I know, oh. which I think is kind of interesting too. Hit director Ryan Johnson, who made one of the best Star Wars movies, The Last Jedi. Yeah. We keep saying that, but man... I don't know that many people that think that's true in real life. You know what I mean? Yeah, anytime I bring that up, people are like, what? Yeah. What's your problem, you dumb bitch? I'm like, fuck you. I hope you die. Whoa. I know good movies. You don't, is what I say. Hmm. Yeah. Anyways, I loved it. And I, I was haunted by yeah. it, especially in the beginning. And, and mm-hmm. during the the ending, too. It's just there's something about that whole aesthetic that is just oh, so fantastic. I just think it's just mm-hmm. so fantastic. And we like... Yeah, we, I'm not sure what it's going to end up doing at the like a, for awards recognition for the Oscars in 2021, but I think it's got good chances theoretically, just because again it's just so well realized overall. Mm-hmm. But there's also like this yeah. fire shot, which I, I think is in the trailer. I'm almost positive, but it's like it a, is, this yeah. backwards fire shot. It's like shot in reverse. It's almost like on like a, one of those weird like bounce loops that you would find on like a GIF. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you noticed that, but that effect is just so cool and also so haunting. And there's like kind of like these weird dream sequences that use it and i just think that those are just also very haunting even there's a lot of good use of sound throughout the film but there's so there's points of silence and you we mentioned the lighting but it's also the the use of the absence of light arguably called darkness in some spaces uh mm-hmm. that's also amazing I've heard too of it. yeah, yeah, I've heard of yeah, it, yeah for sure um but yeah like it's it's really good. Like the absence of sound too. When this is such a bustling, most of the movie is very, very bustling and the use of sound kind of throughout is fantastic. Mm-hmm. But I just noticed the, 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 again, when it gets really quiet, in a not in a way that's like the, a quiet place, but almost like that. And that it's just this weird calm that you know is just this eerie, there's this eerie evil on the horizon. I don't know. I just think, again, there's this yeah. really, really great imagery. But uh, I digress. We watched another movie, Adrian, in that mm. same day, as we just said. The second movie, we did about half an hour before we went back into the theater after it was all sanitized. And we sat in the exact same chairs again. And we watched Licorice Pizza, as you like mm-hmm. to call it. Otherwise known as Licorice Pizza. Yes. A film that also stars Bradley Cooper, but in a much more minor mm-hmm. role. What did you think of this film? I, I really liked this movie while I was watching it. Oh, but the more I've thought about this movie, the more problematic I've realized it is. Interesting. Um, whereas I think this movie is really great. I think it's shot incredibly well. I think it's really funny. Um, incredibly funny. There's some uh, ridiculous shit that goes on in this movie that I just did not see coming. This is another one of those movies where I just kind of went in pretty blind. I wasn't too familiar with the premise. Um, and... I think it go it does a lot of interesting things. Um, however, the movie itself is a little bit problematic based solely on a plot thread that's stretched out in the movie. And it's a, a relationship between a 20 some odd year old woman and a 15 year old boy, which is, uh, yeah, it's just one of those situations where I'm just kind of like, Ugh. It, I feel like, if this was a movie about a 20 mid twenties year old man with a 15 year old woman, it would be a very different story. 
Um, and I was kind of thinking about it from that angle and it kind of grosses me out a bit <laughs> most definitely because th- there shouldn't be that double standard whether this is okay and the other way is not they both shouldn't be okay if that makes sense and again the way the movie kind of uh like goes i guess it- it's it's just kind of problematic to think about but it doesn't take away from how great the movie itself like as a whole in terms of its how it's shot the the music used throughout it and again, the comedy that's sprinkled all throughout this movie, um, it, it's it, all that's really fantastic. But it's just this one nagging thing in the back of my head where it's just like, I feel like I shouldn't like this because of that. And it's kind of disappointing. Um, I don't know. How do you feel about this movie, man? Uh, I really liked it. I, I liked it. I, I know what you're talking about. But yeah, it's that's a it is a very weird situation. It was like uh, I talked about this many many moons back like many episodes back months or months ago but we, i watched for the first time i think the first my first studio ghibli movie i, I think i've ever seen mm-hmm. unless i'm mistaken and i'm pretty sure it was porco rosso um mm-hmm. I, sorry i know i watched porco rosso i'm just saying it i don't know if that was the first yeah, yeah. studio ghibli movie i'd seen but when i watched porco rosso there's this weird thing where they keep sexualizing this girl who's like 14 or something like that i can't yeah. remember her exact age but it was way too young and like all of the, every single male character seems to sexualize her. And it's just so weird. It just doesn't seem like it, it fits. And it, I just kept thinking it was like dated, but I'm like, this is kind of just weird. Like, what's the point? It's, it's so tired too. Cause it's done so often. Yeah. And uh, it bothered me a lot. This bothered me less. Uh, just because of the way that the plot went for this character. I feel like mm-hmm. um, she really didn't, I don't know. It, it's interesting it's an interesting thing. Sorry, we're talking pretty vaguely. It take, takes place in the San Fernando Valley, uh, California. Basically, there's this this girl. She's probably, again, mid-20s approximately based on what they say. And uh, she's working at, at this like photo photo company that takes photos for students kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. As a, yeah, as essentially like school photo shoots at like high schools and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's where she meets like this 15-year-old boy that, is very clearly just like head over heels for her immediately and asks her out on a date. Yeah. And so that basically just goes from there and how she mm-hmm. deals with that kind of relationship or that friendship or whatever it may be. And it does a lot of other things that are just kind of crazy. Like it's a crazy journey of uh, you, as you mm-hmm. call it often, a slice of life movie, but it's like a coming of age story. And it's yeah. uh, it does some pretty – some pretty cool things. It's a crazy adventure. And I feel like both Nightmare Alley and Licorice Pizza, they both go ways I just didn't expect. Like there's so many I different agree. things yeah. and threads in this movie and adventures that these characters go on. It's pretty intriguing for sure. They don't go completely inappropriate in Licorice Pizza. Like let's be clear, I guess. Like if we're not – we're not. I don't know. I don't want to stage this up as some kind of terrible like – I don't know, like pro pedophile movie sort of statutory rape situation or something. you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I don't want to say that. Like, it, it's a weird thing. I don't know. It's just so strange to do this. It's a weird plot point to, to use in this film, but it's definitely balanced delicately. And I wonder if, of course, this is directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, who's an amazing auteur director, just like Guillermo del Toro is, but just in a very different mm-hmm. way. And I, I, I wonder if he used this kind of idea to make uh, like the audience feel uncomfortable on purpose. Yeah. It, it makes you feel uncomfortable kind of the whole time. Whereas the relationship is kind of sweet a lot of the time and it's clearly an interesting, weird friendship. It's It takes some, some strange turns all the way through and you're kind of just like left feeling kind of uncomfortable. You're kind of like liking it, but it's kind of uncomfortable. It's a weird, very strange vibe it gives you, but I, it, it's different mm-hmm. because of the vibe. It's strange. Yeah, I don't know. It's a strange thing that they, again, they go down this path, but it definitely the, the comedy in it is pretty <laughs> laugh out loud funny as I think you would say. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Especially with like Bradley Cooper's character, like his introduction is just so shocking to me. I, again, I, I forgot that he was in this movie um and yeah when he shows up it's he just plays such an over-the-top fucking dude that's uh i i, I, I don't, I don't want to say who, who he's playing because i don't know if that's revealed in the trailer i never watched the trailer but uh yeah again just this over-the-top dude that they end up meeting um uh, because they're you know like moving uh some like some shit for for this guy and uh again yeah the directions this movie takes and like 
how this like 15 year old kids like this entrepreneur and always wants to start a new business and and like you know stay on top of it all is 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 quite great and like you said i think their relationship is like delicately balanced to a certain extent but yeah i don't know uh, there's that back of my mind feeling and yeah maybe maybe he did want the audience to feel uncomfortable but I don't know. Like I, I haven't really looked into it. I haven't, I haven't looked at Paul Thomas Anderson's like comments of this movie or anything. And it's, it's being well rated. Like it's very well regarded. And I think it's deservedly so. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's this weird thing. I, I, it's, it's tough being so positive about something like this. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. I don't know if it's tough being so positive, but I don't know. It's a weird thing. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It's too okay. Just the, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna dance I'm gonna dance a line here a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's an 18 year old rule, right? Yeah. Obviously, you shouldn't be dating somebody under the age of 18 if you're over the age of 18. Like that, that's obvious, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. The thing is, emotional maturity comes in all kinds. That's what I would say. But the kid is clearly shown the 15 year old guy Gary is not mature. Clearly. Mm-hmm. So that's the most problematic part of it. He's both 15 and both not emotionally mature. So that's, I think, what – because you can have a really mature potentially. Again, that's where I'm dancing the line. 17-year-old, 16-year-old, whatever. But even 15 is pretty young. Yeah, it's very – And it's like, but why do you dance that line when you're clearly showing someone who isn't very emotionally mature? But you can also have an extremely not emotionally mature, like 25-year-old as well. Which – Exactly, which is what this movie kind of you know portrays of of this main character. I forget her Maybe, name. Maybe, but yeah. But she's arguably pretty mature in other ways. Like an, an mm-hmm. like I don't know. See, that's where the line is. But again, that's the beauty of it too, because it kind of makes you think in a way. Um, I, I don't know. It's a it's a weird one. It's a weird one for sure. And I feel yeah. like it dances the this kind of line to make you feel uncomfortable. And there's also the concept that they don't go. The, the idea is it's not going super far that I don't think there'll ever be an outroar like there was with cuties or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, 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 like, yeah. It's not like that. And it's, and it's really funny and it's very, I don't know. It's, it's heartfelt. And it's, uh, I think the casting itself is like phenomenal. And Sean um, Penn I, I, is really good too, by the way, like oh, Sean Penn's so amazing good, yeah. in it. And this it's taking place in this kind of, it, like these, there's a, they're surrounded by these actors and, and they're, they're surrounded by Hollywood and this concept of, again, this, these people who are famous and full of themselves. And, um, I, it's that, that whole aspect of like agents kind of seeking out talent and all that stuff while it not really being about that at all. It's so, it's again, such an, I don't know, man, it's such an interesting movie. I really, really, really like it, but yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean in terms of the frustrating part. I don't know. It's uh, again, they don't, they're not showing anything bad. So it's, for me, I don't really care that that's just a, it's just a plot point. I just don't know necessarily if you needed to do that is my only question to Paul Thomas Anderson. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I don't care that much because again, you're, you're dancing a line. You're never, you're not crossing anything. It's not, that's why for you, I would say, I know you like the movie coming out of it because. You told me um, through a text nope. message through Jimmy. Sorry, no. You said no for something? <laughs> yeah, because we don't talk outside this podcast, but I'm glad that you corrected yourself. Of course. Um, through a text message through J- Jimmy that you like this movie better than Nightmare Alley. Now I ask you, Adrian, mm-hmm. did you like Licorice Pizza, a.k.a. Licorice Pizza, better than Nightmare Alley? What do you th- What do you say? Uh, I don't know, honestly. Or did you like Nightmare Alley? Did Nightmare Alley age better as like a, like a fine wine or did Licorice Pizza I guess it sounds like licorice pizza yeah. kind of rotted a little bit in the fridge. Yeah. And uh, Night- Nightmare Alley kind of, you know, fermented into a nice, you know, woody, Jose. woody flavor. I don't, I don't know one. I don't but, know either. Uh, That's, that was me stretching a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. Probably like I still really like licorice pizza. And again, I had so many laughs throughout the movie and it's very enjoyable. But I think Nightmare Alley did age better in my head, where I think of that movie very fondly. There's like nothing I dislike about Nightmare Alley, really. Um, I think the pacing in Nightmare Alley, at least in the beginning, is a little bit um, relentless. It's just like go, go, go. And 
they introduce characters and you just have to kind of imagine that these characters have built relationships over over time and we just didn't get to see it. And like I, I think Nightmare Alley, I almost wanted it to be like a mini series where we could kind of develop the carnival a little bit more and get to know these characters a little bit more. But oh. all in all, I, I still think that movie's fantastic and 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 yeah, I think it did age better in my brain than Licorice Pizza did. So uh yeah, to answer your question, I think Nightmare Alley. Oh, fascinating. Was my favorite out of the two. Cool. Yeah. I think so too, but because I'm just enamored by the way it's shot. I just can't – the lighting is so good as you mentioned. And I just mm. – ah, oh, man, there's just – there's moments in that like I can take – I can see them in my mind's eye kind of thing. I could – I feel like I could wake up in the middle of the night and I like the title for many reasons. But one of them is like it's mm. almost nightmare fuel type situation and the way they shoot – he shoots it. Ah, oh, man. It's all good. And the, again, you said this before, but like all the actors are amazing. Bradley Cooper is like a chameleon between those two roles as well. Like he's such a different yeah, no, guy. It's, it's so wow. interesting having gone into both. And we talked about this at some point. I don't know if it was on the podcast or uh, through a proxy, of course, because we don't talk outside this podcast. But we did talk about how Bradley Cooper was in mm-hmm. Licorice Pizza. But I don't think you remembered that until you saw him in the movie, which I thought was interesting. That's true. And it kind of shocks yeah. you a little bit because he just – He's not shown off initially. He's kind of like, he kind of walks into the frame. I don't know. It was just really well done. He just, he just shows up. Kind of. <laughs> literally just shows yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, and then it just escalates so quickly with his character. I was like, oh my God. The similarities uh, between the two movies too, like in that they're both period pieces, but just in very, very different pe- periods of like kind of American history, time. I guess. Yeah. And they were both take place in the United yeah. States and one in the 1940s or early 1940s, late 1930s and the other one in the 1970s. And um, they just nail the costumes in both of them. They nail the mm-hmm. cars and the, the, you know, all like the kind of the flavoring, the music, especially in Licorice Pizza, by the way. We can't forget about that. The Licorice Pizza music, the choices yeah. of music are phenomenal. If you, when you watch the, like the end credits, there's like, I don't know, 25, 30 songs listed. They're just well, like incredibly well chosen and that they, they just complement the film so well. Mm-hmm. So like, again, it's just, they're both such fully realized masterpieces I, I just love it. I love both of them. I love both of them. And I love mm. the fact that there's this huge big name actors who are just like in cameo roles in Licorice Pizza. That the whereas Nightmare Alley's got a stacked cast of literally star studded talent the whole way through, pretty much. Mm. Licorice Pizza is not that. In fact, Alana Haim and her family are like all in it. Her real family. Mm. Which is yeah, it's nuts. It's funny because I was watching this movie and I'm like, man, the casting in this movie is really great. Like, they all look very similar. Like her and her, her family look very similar. And then the credits start rolling. I'm like, oh, it's because they are all literally related to one another. And they're named their names. It is literally her family, which is interesting. Yeah. Like her, their names are the same. So uh, Alana, Alana, who's in the film as the character, is the, literally the actor's name. And it was kind of a breakout role for both her and uh, Cooper Hoffman, who plays Gary. So pretty, pretty good. And like the performances on their part is are pretty amazing. And I think honestly, there's something to be said about that. I don't know that every one of these people in this family, like the Haim family, is an amazing actor. Alana Haim is in it for a lot, so I'd say she's a pretty good actor. I would say she's great. In this film, I think you might agree. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. But I would also say that to get them all to be in that that level, I guarantee you a really good director can make actors that may not be amazing pretty darn great. And I think that I mean that that this is proof in the like proof is in the pudding in a way. Proof is mm-hmm. in this film, or proof is in the licorice pizza, in that literally he has like I don't know how many family members there were, but there were like seven family members. And they all seem like they were just actors. To me, I did not even – I didn't clue in that they're like anything other than actors because they just seemed so, so natural. Like it didn't seem to me like they mm-hmm. were going through the motions. And I bet you, again, because Paul Thomas Anderson is so good at what he does, it's just – he slows it down with them. He makes sure that they're amazing. And so a really amazing director can kind of make – somebody really good same with amazing writing like he wrote this film as well paul thomas anderson did so like he I, and i think in contrast you look at a movie like i don't know the the attack of the clones yeah oof. i feel like hayden Pin- uh, hayden penichier <laughs> yeah hayden. from from heroes <laughs> anakin skywalker hayden penichier no hayden christensen could have been pretty good 
I wonder if the writing just didn't do him justice. Whereas like if they had slowed it down, if they had kind of massaged the lines for him, it would have maybe been a little bit more natural or seen like better actor. If Paul Thomas Anderson directed Attack of the Clones, you know, it would have been, oh man, that would have been a completely different movie for sure. (laughs) But anyway, yeah, I'm not saying George Lucas is bad or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. That's exactly what you said. You said that you hate him. I'm just saying that. And he made bad movies. Just talking about Paul Thomas Anderson, director Paul Thomas Anderson. It seems like from this that he's kind of like an actor's director in a way. Like he's he's in their corner like 100%. Like he made them look great. They may be naturals. I have no idea, but I can't believe that you can have like, again, it wasn't a seven. How many people? There were three girls. Oh, five. I don't know where I'm getting seven from. Yeah, there's yeah, the three girls and the, the <laughs> Plus parents. Plus two other people that don't exist. No, there wasn't seven. It's five yeah. in total. And I just thought they were just – they just felt like real people. I just – again, it's, it's mm-hmm. pretty crazy that he was able to pull that off. So kudos to him. Yeah. I, I feel like – do we should we just call it now he wins Best Director <laughs> for um, the Oscars? But I mean, how do you do that? It's possible. It could be Guillermo del Toro, honestly, though, because it's such a unique yeah. and like distinct vision for Nightmare Alley. But yeah. – we haven't seen all the films yet. Also, honestly, though, Power of the Dog has a good chance of winning like a quite a oh, bit yeah. too. Like this was again a crazy year for films. Like for 2021, like it really was a crazy, crazy year. Like it's pretty interesting. Like Jane Campion did a great mm-hmm. movie, a great job in that film for that directing that movie. But anyway, yeah, Johannes Roberts with uh, Resident Evil. Welcome to Raccoon City. You know what I mean? Jesus Christ, man! Great Stop movies. with Raccoon City, okay? Raccoon Town was not a good film, and we just need to we it's need to movie. accept that and move on. Was it fun? Sure, it's a great movie. It was a fun time, but it wasn't a great movie. Let's be let's be honest with ourselves. No, with the audience. Okay. Anyways, my point is, Nightmare Alley, Licorice Pizza, definitely recommend. Recommend all the way. Me too. Amazing films. Yeah, and I'm a fan. Cool. Alrighty, uh, should we get on to the news? What do you think? No. Uh, well, that's too bad. Let's begin with a small collection of more focused stories that have been particularly pertinent this week. Number one, as announced by Ontario Premier Doug Ford on January 3rd, all theaters throughout Ontario, including Canada's largest theater chain, Cineplex, have been forced to temporarily close their doors until at least January 26th due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As mandated by the provincial Ontario government, many indoor businesses have had their capacities severely limited in order to curb the spread of the Omicron variant that currently threatens to overwhelm Ontario's hospitals and our overall healthcare system. These mandates were officially initiated on January 5th and are planned for a minimum 21-day period prior to any sort of reevaluation. Adrian, we kind of talked about this very briefly just moments ago. What are you making of this mm-hmm. announcement that all of these theaters are closed down? Well, Simon, I know this is very specific for a region of the world that not everyone lives in, but... Uh, a lot of our audience live in Ontario, though. So there's that. Yeah, that's fair. That's true. That's true. But um, this is very upsetting to me. It, um, I'm very frustrated and annoyed about this choice from our premier um, and this this lack of understanding of, of of how COVID is spreading and closing down everything that people love, yet leaving a bunch of other shit open and doing these dumbass half-measure fucking things um, is beyond frustrating to me. And there have been literally no outbreaks um, from movie theaters. Mm, I don't know about that. Um, as far as we're aware of. Yeah. Um, And like Cineplex uh, president even mentioned that. And uh, I just feel like this fucking sucks. I'm glad we got to do the double Bradley Cooper feature um, on, you know, the Tuesday, like on the fourth, just prior to this. But it's just so frustrating to me. It's these dumb, like you say plenty of times, these dumbass half measures. You don't say the dumbass part, but these half measures. And like, what's the point of doing this? It's all, all, all this is just taking away things that people love doing trying to like unwind and forget about all the shit that's going on. And it's, uh, it just sucks, man. Either close it all down or close down things. I don't like doing and keep the movie theaters open. You know what I'm saying? I can't tell if you're being serious or not. Cause that doesn't make any sense, but you kind of, your, your message was kind of muddled by the end there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not, I'm not being serious. I'm obviously joking, but like, again, just either close it all down and just fucking, I don't know. I don't know. It's just frustrating. Um, I don't know, man. This is a tough one because, like, uh, the hospitals are literally being overwhelmed right now. So, um, I don't know that the theaters would have solved it. Although, I think that not having fifty, like, more than fifty percent capacity, is kind of 
I don't know. That was a really packed theater for Spider-Man No Way Home, man. Mm-hmm. You you were nervous about it too. Like, let's be honest. Yeah, and I, I was nervous, but we want it. We want the theaters to be packed. That's what we want, but we we shouldn't be packed. Just, that just can't happen right now. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Like, I liked what Cineplex was doing before, where you know you could buy seats up to I think like five in a row, and then it blocked off the seats beside you and the seats behind you and stuff like that. I feel like we could still be doing that, and uh, we could still have some enjoyment in our fucking lives. So. You know, it's it just I, I was thinking like when the, when they shut down the theaters, I was like, at least I have Cuba. You know, I'm gone for, you know, like a week of this uh, of this three week sort of planned, like minimum planned, uh, you know, closure. So I was like, I'm OK with it. And then Cuba got canceled. And now it's just like, fuck, man, what like wh- what? I'm just going to work and going home and being all depressed. It sucks. It, it's it's frustrating. And I understand like, yeah, hospitals are overrun. Um why just close the enter the en- the entertaining stuff? Then shut everything down. Let's have a real lockdown once again. Don't even like leave just random tech stores open or whatever. Just close fucking everything down. Keep the groceries open, and then just make everyone stay in, in, inside for however long. Yeah, that, you know no, I mean? that I agree with because I think it's inevitable. I don't know, maybe not, but it seems like it's going to close down anyway, isn't it? I, I don't I don't understand. That's what that's how it feels like. Yeah. Well, it's the record number of hospitalizations in the last few days. Like we're recording this, of course, on a Saturday, and we had the, we hit the record again today. So I, I don't really understand yeah. why did you leave anything open? Just close it down. But people are upset. They don't want to get any lockdowns. No lockdowns, right? That's a, that's a thing that that's being said. So they're mm-hmm. waiting until the last second and then choosing to lock it down anyway. Meanwhile, they could have just got ahead of it, locked it down right away, and then maybe gotten the head start on it. But now. The hospitals are getting overwhelmed because really you didn't do anything about it. Closing down theaters yeah. is really not going to solve everything. It's again, there's a lot of people going into retail locations to buy clothes, to buy whatever. The malls are still open. There's not really any difference. You're just pretending while you close down restaurants yeah. and uh, those people get to suffer. But for some reason, retail stores don't. It's it's a it's a it's an odd yeah. it's an odd thing that I agree with. I don't necessarily agree that theaters don't necessarily need to be closed down too. I do think that that was ridiculously packed. That's a mold. That's a mass spreading mm-hmm. event if I've ever seen one because it's just too many people in there. It was ridiculous, and it, to me, it's irresponsible on Cineplex's part. I think that they should have already been doing when they knew about Omicron. They should have already kind of locked it to fifty percent, anyways. Thinking like mm-hmm. making their own policies. They kind of made a little bit of a selfish move, in my opinion. Like they really wanted to get the, as much money as they could out of Spider Man. Although those were pre-sale tickets that went up like a month before. So in their defense, mm-hmm. but um, well, a long, long time before. But anyway, I don't know. This is a. It's really sad. Obviously, we love the theaters, and I, I do. Obviously, I do love the theaters a lot. I just think that uh, I don't know what else you're going to do. You got. You're right, though. Shutting everything down seems like the way to go. It's strange that they had to do this again. It seemed like it was under control with. With the vaccines and clearly mm-hmm. the vaccines are working. Let's just clearly say that. That's obvious. I mean, the case counts are outrageous yeah. and there's not even close to as many. Well, how are people still getting it if everyone's vaccinated? Huh? Yeah. Unfortunately, the vaccinations don't really stop the people getting it part. They just stop people from dying. So yeah. you won't die if you get vaccinated and you won't clog up the hospitals because you're now way too sick because you didn't get vaccinated. And stopping people who are potentially have cancer or have some other disease that need the hospital from getting a proper surgery or getting checked out um, because you're clogging it up because you decided not to get vaccinated. Because that's the truth. That's what's really happening out there. Um, Mm -hmm. It's really rough, actually. A lot of the hospitals are in cold orange. It's uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the weeks ahead. I'm sorry about your Cuba trip, but if I'm being honest with you, I don't think you would have had an easy time coming back in. Like uh, it might have been tough. Yeah, maybe. I just talked to somebody but. who came back over Christmas and they had to – they were driving, thankfully. But they they were trying to get COVID tests, but you couldn't get a COVID test in the, from the states. So they were driving from the states from Florida back to Ontario. They couldn't get a COVID mm-hmm. test to come back in. It wasn't possible. They couldn't find one anywhere. Hmm. So they were kind of stuck. And it's like imagine what happens if you're in, in Cuba, especially because they were actually inevitably let in because they were driving. If it was a plane, it would have been mm-hmm. different. But because they were driving, they're like, well, we're not going to leave you at the border. We got to get you out of here. <laughs> so they just let them come in and take a PCR test when back home, which is an interesting, mm-hmm. weird half measure there. But at the same time, with Cuba and a flight, they're not really necessarily going to let you on a flight if you didn't get a test. If you can't find a test in Cuba because everyone needs to get a test, then what? 
What's what's crazy, uh, like I was reading like the fact uh, for prior to going to Cuba, and if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to take a test to go on the plane to go there. That makes no sense. You just have to take a test coming back. Yeah. I thought that was very weird Yeah, as well, which like threw me off. There's a lot of things that make no sense. Like for instance, yeah. the five-day period thing that the CDC initi- like initiated is very vague if you read the, the actual rules on that. And Ontario followed suit and did the same thing. I don't know, man. The great thing is that Omicron is no, definitely not as harsh as, especially if you're vaccinated compared to the rest of COVID, like the other COVID variants. So that that's an awesome yeah. thing. But unfortunately, it's still overwhelming hospitals. So it's a kind of irrelevant. <laughs> like mm-hmm. if people are still sick enough that they're literally clogging up the ICU, which hasn't, again, it hasn't completely happened yet, but it's been it's been really bad in some hospitals in near Toronto and the GTA. It, it, again, it's... Oh man, I thought we were going to get through this. I thought we we're, I thought we we're on our way out, but alas, it's the longest fucking two weeks of my life. Uh, because of Omicron, you mean? No, because because it's like it, we'll we'll stop the curve. Or, oh yeah, like yeah. In two weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. The longest two weeks. Was it? What was it? Ex- not stop the curve. It's uh, flatten the curve. Sorry. Flatten, flatten. Good old yeah. flatten the curve. Flatten the curve. Just two weeks. Two weeks. That was ridiculous. Two weeks. Come on. <sighs> Who estimated that? Honestly, uh, though, there's a lot of things that I feel like aren't based on data and science that were announced right away like that. That's clearly not based on anything. That's just somebody, some politician made that as like a, as a little quip. You can put on a little sign, you know, you can put it online. <laughs> marketing, marketing 101. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily true, but it keeps people from not, you know, panic buying toilet paper. <laughs> it didn't though. It still, it still <laughs> it made still, people panic. But imagine how, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't be finding toilet paper until right now if they had made flatten the curve. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Thank God I can find toilet paper. You know what I mean? Like I didn't do that. Yeah, I, you'd be I'm using just... your dog for toilet uh, toilet paper. The what? Your dog. You'd use your dog as toilet paper. Would you use your dog as toilet paper, Adrian? I thought you loved your dog. No, I'm just saying that. Oh, it's very gross. I was just like, yeah, I just got to fucking shoot it down. And just, what was just the number for PETA bring again? Bring this to the, the, halt, the halt. PETA? PETA, I don't know. It's uh 1866 PETA bread, I think. That's dumb. That was a dumb joke. Yeah. You're a dumb joke. That's a dumb joke. And now it's time to move on to number two and to some, you know, some more happy waters here. Number two, as reported by publication, The Hollywood Reporter, co-owners Warner Media and Viacom CBS are looking to sell their TV network, the CW. The CW. Oh, that is good news. The CW. Really? The CW was conceived <laughs> as a TV channel targeting audiences between the ages of 18 and 34. The Hollywood Reporter notes that despite the co-ownership between Warner and CBS, most of the CW's popular TV content created over the last few years, has been provided by Warner Media. Warner Brothers' Arrowverse has been incredibly well-received by fans, featuring shows like Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, and Superman and Lois from the DC Universe. But unfortunately, it has been reported that the CW has not turned a profit since the network's inception in 2006. A large chunk of the CW's reported revenue during the last 10 years was actually delivered by a very lucrative deal set with Netflix that ended in 2019. That deal had many shows from the CW, such as Riverdale and The 100, landing on streaming giant Netflix very shortly after these series debuted on linear broadcast channel, The CW. This unique deal between The CW and Netflix arguably ended in 2019 due to the impending premiere dates for both the Viacom CBS streaming service Paramount Plus, previously CBS All Access, Mm -hmm. and Warner Media's HBO Max. The two massive distributors also started to hoard content for their new streaming services in order to stay competitive during the streaming wars. In a memo to his team, the CW CEO, Mark Pedowitz, stated, quote, I am sure you have seen the recent speculation in the press around the CW, so I wanted to take the opportunity to address this with you directly and share with you what we know. First, as many of you are aware, over the past year or so, this transformative time in our industry has led to a series of business activity across media and content companies. Given that environment right now, Viacom, CBS, and Warner Brothers are exploring strategic opportunities to optimize the value of their joint venture in the CW network. It's too early to speculate what might happen, but we promise to keep you updated as we learn more. So what does this mean for us right now? It means we must continue to do what we do best, make the CW as successful and vibrant as we have always done. We have a lot of work ahead of us with more original programming than ever, this season's expansion to Saturday night and our growing digital and streaming platforms. And we thrive when we come together and build the CW together. Signed, Mark. Unquote. Thanks, Mark. Adrian, what are you thinking about this news? 
I decided to put the whole memo in there. I kind of regretted it after as I read it. But anyway, mm. I thought the memo kind of gives some gives some evidence of what I was talking mm-hmm. about with this whole situation that the Hollywood Reporter had reported on. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's an interesting thing because I don't think I knew necessarily that CBS was a co owner. I'm not sure now. I'm now I'm confused. It's be- probably because again. Even even Riverdale, which is an incredibly popular show for the CW and Netflix, somehow is yeah. Warner Brothers. It's not yeah. C- it's not uh, CBS. And the Arrowverse is a massive number of TV shows. Um, one I didn't mention was Legends of Tomorrow. <laughs> so I I don't know. What do you make of this whole situation? I don't know. I think uh, it is kind of interesting to hear that it didn't really turn a profit since its inception and you know that deal with netflix i honestly didn't even realize that deal came to an end it kind of makes sense because you don't really see those cw shows you know airing week to week on netflix anymore i did mention that uh, a couple episodes ago that um you know netflix did do that with some of the shows and those shows uh, happen to be those cw ones um but i don't know like it, it, it's interesting like if if warner media and cbs ten, er, end up selling the cw um like network I would imagine they're not going to license out or sell any of the, you know, DC related IP. So we can either assume all of those shows would just move on HBO Max or be canceled entirely. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, it's going to just be stripped for parts, right? If they're they're yeah. talking about selling it to a company called Next Star, which has like 100 channels or something like that. It's got a, mm-hmm. quite a few broadcast channels. But like, there's no yeah. way like, well, Supergirl's ending. But like Superman and Lois seems to be going strong. The Flash seems to still be going somehow. So like yeah, Legends of Tomorrow somehow as well. Yeah. So it seems Bat like girl. They, they also moved or some of these units to HBO Max anyway. Yeah. So wouldn't they just keep doing that? Probably. Because like when you really think about it, the CW doesn't really have much original IP. Yeah, there's the 100, which isn't based on anything. But Riverdale is based on like those Archie comics and stuff like that. And you know, they did have Supernatural, but Supernatural is done. Like they had 15 seasons. I don't know how much more you can milk that series. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, they've had like a couple of original shows here and there, but easily their most popular programming is based on existing IP that is owned by these huge parent companies. So without that, what is the CW? You know, I feel like it's a near worthless network, <laughs> realistically, without without the backing of all this IP. And uh, yeah, again, like if they did tend to make the switch to HBO Max, I'm pretty certain not all of that is going to survive. Like not all these shows are going to survive. They'll probably, you know, keep Superman and Lois on, but you know, like why continue things and, you know, almost put a, put a, like a negative smudge on like your HBO Max service, HBO known for its, highest quality, you know, home box office, high quality television. And then you just fill it with a bunch of shit. You know what I mean? It, it, it would seem like a, you really don't like those shows Poor business <laughs> move. Yeah. <laughs> fill it with a bunch of shit. <laughs> no offense it, to it Berlanti seem- here. Greg Berlanti. Jeez, man. I, I like you again. I like you. Me? Yeah. You Simon. I do Aww. like you, but also the Netflix original show you. I didn't get that from all the insults you were spewing at me the rest of this episode. So yeah, you deserve it though. Whoa. You bitch. I'm just kidding. You're not a bitch. Really. So you don't like me. You just like the Netflix show you. I get it. Mm-hmm. With Penge, Penge Badgley. I don't know why I'm saying Penge. Penge Bletchley. <laughs> Penge Banley. No. Benjamin Pen Badgley. Badgley said correctly. Yeah. Pretty good actor. Pretty good actor. He's really great in that show. He is. He's awesome. Anyway. Someone I aspire to be. <laughs> Just kidding. That guy's a fucking psychopath in that show. Jeez, man. <laughs> it gives a whole, whole other meaning to when you say you're in my walls. I'm inside your walls right now. No. Mm-hmm. You're not. You're not. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's kind of my thoughts on this whole CW being sold thing. Like, what do you think? I kind of said it in the write-up a little bit. I don't know. I think it's weird that CBS didn't really contribute. <laughs> it's not weird. <laughs> it's like a 50-50 split and they didn't really contribute and they just seem to be like, just got a, like a, just got a pass. 
Like Berlanti's like a freaking that guy's a marathon runner. That guy is a he's a machine. He's a machine. And I honestly, you calling it shit? I don't think his content is shit. Okay, it's just extremely oversaturated. There's too many episodes for each of these seasons. That's an issue. But ultimately, I said this a couple of weeks back. But it's all good, man. It's all good. It's not terrible. It's just uh, kind mm-hmm. of kind of a lot of the same and the drama is kind of hyped up because you don't have you know you have to make drama between two characters because one of them eat your can of beans or something you know you can't you, you want, there's no time eat my can of beans I, there is more from the refrigerator exactly when i specifically asked you not to exactly sorry too much time not enough my mother yeah gave me that can of beans too many episodes on her 50th birthday right yeah anyway too many episodes for my 25th birthday <laughs> Just it just keeps going. Too much time to fill. Oh no, twenty five. I don't know. Maybe too old for those characters. I'm joking, but oh, but also kind of true. Like they, they also don't yeah. hit a certain age. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're over the age of thirty five, no, you're cut. <laughs> no, Stephen Amell, you're too old, bro. You're too bro- old, bro. You're going to that wrestling show on uh, Showtime, isn't it? Stars, which apparently is very good. Heels, stars. Sorry, stars. Yeah, you're right. Heels. On stars, which is apparently pretty good, uh, mm. and I don't mind Stephen Amell. He's good. I like him. Yeah, he's all right. He did, he did an okay job. He kind of started that whole that whole universe. But again, very, 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 very dramatic TV series. Mm-hmm. My name is Arrow, and you have failed this city, or something like that. You failed the city. No, it's not not quite that cool. You have failed this city. Why are you saying it like that? He doesn't talk like that in the show at all. You have failed this city. You hear me, you son of a gun? That's actually closer. <laughs> That's closer. <laughs> uh, anyway, point is, I thought that was weird. And then the fact that they would sell it, also weird. And you pointed out something obvious. It seems like they're just going to strip it for parts and then just get rid of it. doesn't make sense. The CW doesn't make sense in the streaming era. It's all streaming. Mm-hmm. And it's all kind of moving that way, except for when it comes to Bell and Rogers, who are just going to be stuck in time for the rest of their lives. They're always going to just be making broadcast TV no matter what happens. Bell and Rogers, folks, if you're living in the States, is a, is the Canadian major broadcast, really the, the biggest companies in Canada. They own all the mm-hmm. telecom shit with all the internet. They own the, the cell towers. They own the TV channels, whether it be CTV or global. Anyway. It's just kind of mm-hmm. crazy how much they own. They co-own freaking sports teams. I don't know how that works in terms of like anti-competitive yeah. like clauses, et cetera. But regardless, yeah, that's the world we live in in Canada at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason why Simon is only clarifying to the Americans and not anyone else living outside of Canada is because he thinks you guys are stupid. And I disagree with him entirely. I think Americans are intelligent. But si- Simon, for whatever whoa, reason, whoa. doesn't. And I apologize. Uh, I apologize on his behalf, guys. I'm I, I'm not saying anybody's stupid. That's not what you I said. said it. And Adrian would never know if I thought that because we don't talk about this podcast. So the guy is full of shit right now. That's all I'm saying. But at the same time, at the same time, you're right, Adrian. I should have said the rest of the world mm-hmm. out there. The reason why I said to the Americans out there, the reason honestly, is because we actually got an uptick of uh, – United States viewers. So I just, listeners, I, my apologies. We don't really have anything to view because we're a podcast. Uh, but specifically, that's why I said that. That's my mistake because we've got a lot of uh, listeners, especially, especially in New Zealand. Man. Oh, because we're the number one, the number two podcast in New Zealand. Don't say still. number one. Okay. Don't say number one. It's not number one. Don't be, don't be inaccurate. We're only accurate myself. on this podcast. Okay. We're number two in New Zealand. I literally corrected myself immediately. <laughs> Jesus. I just want to make it clear how serious I take this. Anyways, Adrian, yeah. that's it for what I have to say about the CW. But uh, It sucks. Yeah, not profitable after having all of these crazy shows, which I thought were just really popular. So it's kind of also shocking. But anyway, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Arguably, they stopped the deal with Netflix for obvious reasons. If there's, They knew in 2019 they're going to branch out and make HBO Max and uh, like make CBS All Access Paramount Plus and make it bigger. So I think that that part is kind of obvious. Mm-hmm. Makes sense not to really give Netflix a deal when you can just throw yeah. whatever show you have on HBO Max. The streaming wars of 2019 are still raging on three years later. The streaming wars. Moving on to number three. Oh my God. As Deadline reports, Disney recently announced that its upcoming Pixar animated feature film, Turning Red, will no longer be coming to theaters in 2022. Instead, Turning Red is now planned to be a Disney Plus streaming launch exclusive on the previously announced March 11th, 2022 release date. 
The Domi she directed, Turning Red, is set to follow a 13-year-old Chinese-Canadian protagonist who turns into a giant red panda bear whenever she is feeling anxious. Turning Red's upcoming Disney Plus launch will mark Disney's third consecutive Pixar film that they have chosen to premiere as a Disney Plus exclusive. Previously, 2021's Luca and 2020's Soul were each Disney Plus exclusives as well. Hmm. Adrian, what do you make of what do you make of this? I, I, I know that you said a couple of weeks back that you were excited for Turning Red. There's there are trailers. Mm-hmm. If you haven't listened to why am I saying listened now? If you haven't watched them, audience, there are trailers out there for. Uh, the Turning Red movie, which it looks very, very cute. And I like the Canadian uh, the Canadian connection here. It's great. Yeah, it looks adorable. Like Domi Shi uh, directed um, that nice little uh, Pixar short film called Bow, which you can watch on Disney Plus, which is a four minute heart wrencher that I absolutely loved. Yeah, um, for sure. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm of like two minds uh, about this. Like I, I'm excited uh, because sweet. Uh, if theaters are somehow still closed in fucking March, which I hope they're not, uh, we get to watch this from the comfort of our own home. But I also feel almost like Pixar's getting shafted. Like they're getting all their movies put on Disney plus. They're not premier access, which I am happy about. I do want to clarify, but it almost feels like Disney is viewing Pixar as the, of the lesser of the two animation studios because, you know, when they're, when they're releasing the Disney content on Disney Plus, it's premiere access, and the other Disney movies are going to theaters. So it's a little bit of a confusing sort of thing, and I can't imagine people that are a part of Pixar are all too pleased about this. It just seems kind of like bad optics. Even um, Onward, uh, which I think... Uh, which is a Pixar movie that was also released on um, Disney plus as well. Right. It was onward Disney, uh, Disney or is that Pixar? I don't remember actually uh, onward is it. Pixar and also launched in theaters. Oh, it was a double. Yeah. Good call. Good call. No, not a double it launched in theaters first. Oh, and then eventually uh, went to uh, Disney. Plus. Shortly after it had to go to Disney plus only because of the pandemic, which just started. So basically, oh. they went to theaters in March or like late February of 2020, and then the pandemic hit, and then they were like, "Oh shit, no one went to go see this movie," and so they were like one of the, I guess, the first Pixar movie to launch on or yeah. get launched or put put on Disney Plus in very, very pretty close proximity. I think within two or three weeks of its launch in mm-hmm. theaters, but only because of like almost like a panic situation, and a lot of people watched it on. Disney Plus, from what I understand, because of this. Yeah, that's where I watched, like, Pixar's My Dad's a Pair of Pants or whatever. Me too. Um, yeah, I watched it kind of way later um, yeah. as the pandemic started. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, like, again, I, I'm, I'm stoked to be able to watch this. Uh, but, yeah, I, I just kind of feel for Pixar. <laughs> like, they're they're obviously a big studio. I shouldn't feel bad for them. But I'm sure, you know, a lot of people are putting their heart and soul into these movies. No pun intended, actually. Um, and, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, and yeah i don't know it must suck to almost feel like your movies are lesser than the one of the parent company mine so yeah your company simon yeah i see what you're saying for sure um my thing is less so about pixar being shafted it is weird that march is so far out theoretically omicron would have the tapered off by then so that's the weirdest thing about this is that uh, you're not pushing anything. This is the beginning of March, and like we're in January, the mm-hmm. beginning of January now. So it's like, what are you, what are you anticipating? I, I don't really understand that aspect. Yeah, that's a very strange choice in that regard. Um, it is weird. This is the third one in a row because Pixar is clearly, in my opinion, and I think you, as you just said, your opinion, mm-hmm. the better one. Yeah, I agree. Like Disney Plus does a great job. I'm sorry, Disney Plus. Disney does a great job in terms of Disney animation as well, but I just don't. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just think Luca and Soul especially were masterpieces. Yeah. And um, Luca's like a perfect summer movie. I would have went to see it. Although, again, it launched in June. Not really, theaters weren't really open, well, at least here in Canada in June, Mm -hmm. if I recall correctly. They were just starting to open. I don't recall anything. They were just starting to open in July. We have an episode called Theaters Are Back Baby. And I think that was in like August or July. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's how I'm I'm judging that. <laughs> anyway, that incredibly scientific <laughs> um, data that we have. It's good. Science, man. You should believe it. That a- episode, something or other, theaters are back, baby, exclamation point. Yeah. Should believe scientists and science. We should believe scientists. Adrian, 
There's one other thing I would like to point out about, the, about this story that's very important. And the, actually, the Deadline article specifically points it out, and I didn't really think about it until they pointed it out. And, and I really do okay. appreciate what the writer was saying in this article. Point it out. Um, well, why did they announce a date and say it's going to theaters specifically – and then say they're going to put it on Disney+. Plus. Imagine these exhibitors and what they think of Disney at this point. It's just such a slight. There's no... Well, why are you doing this? Oh, here's the carrot. Here's the carrot. Nope. We're taking it away. We, we're going to take it from you. You're not, going to, you're not going to get a movie. You thought you were going to get a Pixar movie? Oh, fools. Like, I don't understand that. What is that about mm-hmm. is my question. That's the thing. The, if anyone was slighted, I feel like Soul and Luca were actually very well watched. So I think that maybe they weren't even slighted because I feel like maybe more people went, got to see those than they got to see Encanto, which now I guess Encanto's on Disney Plus. So it's all good. It is, yeah. But at the same time, at the same time now, I should say, if we're turning red, in March, on March 11th, there's a good chance that COVID won't be as big of a deal. But they chose to specifically take it away, even though we didn't even wait to see that this was an, an, you know, an emerging problem. It's just very unusual timing for all of this. This is, just seems like, don't announce that you're going to put it on in theaters. Just say when it's going to come out. Don't say maybe how it's going to come out. Or just be a little bit more strategic about this. What are you giving the theaters who really got you to where you are? Like, don't step on them on like their damn heads as they're, as you're, as they're suffering right now. They're in bad shape. Like, they're not in good shape. Like, Spider-Man did a great job to kind of keep them afloat, but that was Sony, too. Like, Sony insists on having that in theaters. What if it was Marvel? Like, what what would have happened then? Eternals didn't have that long of a uh, theatrical exclusivity. So, I I don't know, man. I just kind of feel like Disney's kind of, again, making these weird moves that are just about the big guy, the big big house of mouse. They just kind of care about themselves a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, I'm not liking it. It makes me feel kind of gross. You know what I'm saying? So... I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. That's all. And that, that uh, deadline article, I feel like I'm not giving it enough credit, but you can read it again. Deadline turning red. I wish I should, I should have written down the author of it. Cause he, again, he made a very good point. I'm kind of quoting his, his opinion here, but um, that is a, again, a, a solid point that I kind of agree with. I kind of feel bad about the, the, the exhibitors. And so remember that, remember in the beginning of the pandemic with Mulan, when Mulan was first, mm-hmm. I don't think they had a choice. Honestly, they were, they were in rough shape. Like in 2020, it was very difficult to launch a movie in theaters. Like even Tenet did really poorly, even though it's like a huge hit, like Christopher Nolan movies, people love to go out to watch a Christopher Nolan blockbuster. It still lost money. And Mulan was theoretically going to make a lot of money in theaters as most of these uh, live action Disney movies do, but not when there's a pandemic. So at the, so they kind of pulled it and they say, we're going to put this exclusively on Disney Plus. And when they did that, these exhibitors were like ripping signs and video. They were like taking the Mulan poster and like lighting it on fire. <laughs> did, you, did you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that, man. Um, good times. Good times back then. Um, real quick, uh, just, just to let you know, the uh, author of that Deadline article was Anthony D'Alessandro. Oh, well done. Well done. Yeah. I appreciate you looking that up for me. No worries, man. Giving the credit where the credit is due. Yeah. That's what we do on our show. Split Focus, a film and TV podcast. We're here every week, baby. It's true. 80 weeks in a row, 80 more to go. And maybe onward. I guess we're yeah. going to find out. My dad's a pair of pants. Now onto the montage. A sequence of our show in which I briefly present the week's smaller news stories as Adrian delivers a brisk verdict. Number one. According to publication deadline, Wrath of Man actor Josh Hartnett has been cast in director Christopher Nolan's next World War II-based film following the creation of the atomic bomb by physicist Robert J. Oppenheimer. Ooh, I'm quite excited uh, for this movie. Honestly, the cast just keeps on building. Number two. As stated in an Apple press release, the Crown actor Tobias Menzies has been cast in a recently greenlit Apple TV Plus original limited series surrounding the aftermath of the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth. Oh my goodness. That guy was assassinated? Just kidding, I knew that. It's a famous story. Number three. As reported by The Hollywood Reporter, the Crown actor Vanessa Kirby will replace Killing Eve star Jodie Comer as Josephine in Ridley Scott's upcoming Napoleon Bonaparte-centered film starring Joker actor Joaquin Phoenix. Ooh, interesting. Um, I don't know what show I'm going to watch after Cobra Kai. I might start Killing Eve. Who knows? I'm not, I don't know. Maybe me. Number four. 
According to Deadline, Knives Out actor Chris Evans is very likely to play showman Gene Kelly in a film written by Gladiator screenwriter John Logan with a plot originally outlined by Chris Evans. The film is set to follow a 12-year-old boy who makes a friend of an imaginary Gene Kelly on the MGM studio lot in 1952. Oh, that's quite neat. I like that uh, Chris Evans is just, you know, expanding more and more after his Captain America role. Number five. According to Deadline, Sopranos star Michael Imperioli has been cast in the second season of the well-reviewed HBO dramedy series White Lotus. Okay, okay. Number six. According to Deadline, Amazon's upcoming Jonathan Nolan Lisa Joy executive produced TV series based on the Bethesda Game Studios ever popular video game series Fallout has chosen its showrunners. Tomb Raider screenwriter Geneva Robertson Duaret and Silicon Valley screenwriter Graham Wagner have each been hired on to head up the much anticipated post nuclear apocalypse set TV show, while Westworld director Jonathan Nolan will direct the show's pilot. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Um, I'm not fully sold on this movie, but I'm uh, uh, sorry, this show, but I'm definitely curious about it. Number seven. As publication Variety reports, French dispatch director Wes Anderson has signed on to direct an adaptation of author Roald Dahl's novel, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, for streaming juggernaut Netflix. The new film will star Benedict Cumberbatch, Ben Kingsley, Rafe Fiennes, and Dev Patel. Oh, that's a good cast right there, Simon. Indeed it is. Number eight. As announced via... As announced via... Via... Uh, via... Uh, via... Uh, via... Uh, via... Uh, via... Jesus, are you okay? As announced <laughs> via... Uh, via... As announced via... Bot, <laughs> shut up, I gotta <laughs> read this. As announced via Bot News Network promo video... Oh, it is A. Oh, man. Number eight. <laughs> you better keep that all in. As announced via a Vought News Net... Why would I keep that in? It's awful. Yeah, that's the point. No, no, no. No, 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 Show no. your flaws. Number eight. As announced via a Vought News Network promo video posted by Amazon Prime, season three of the raunchy superhero drama The Boys will officially launch on June 3rd, 2022 on streaming service Amazon Prime Video. Ooh, that's exciting. I'm quite excited for season three. Number nine, as Variety has reported, Call Me By Your Name director Luca Guadagnino is directing an Audrey Hepburn biopic with Nightmare Alley actor Rooney Mara cast in the leading role. Oh, okay. Rooney Mara was great in Nightmare Alley, so maybe I'll watch this. I don't know. Number 10, as Deadline reports, Sony's upcoming Spider-Man-based film Morbius has been pushed back from its January 28th release date to an April 1st, 2022 release date instead. Oh no, I'm so excited for this movie. This was my most anticipated movie of, of the month of January. Mm. It's not. And that concludes the montage. Morbius. <laughs> Jeez Louise, man. Jeez Louise, eh? What do you got for me? I got new releases for you, Simon. All right. All right, then. This is for the week of January the 10th to January the 16th. Will I miss movies again? Who knows? I don't. Probably. You probably will miss movies this week. We'll never know until we listen and hear. Yes, will we find out? Until next time. Should we talk like this the whole time? Definitely not. What if we did a whole episode like this? Wouldn't that be great? I'd hate that. No, it wouldn't be. Why not? Because I would rather sound like Willem Dafoe. Yeah, good luck. Do a Willem Dafoe impression right now. I dare you. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, was that? That was my Willem Dafoe. Oh, that was it? Oh, okay. Oh, come on down to Nightmare Alley. That's actually not bad, actually. That was okay. Yeah. I got the vibe. Thanks. It was like an impression of an impression. You know what I mean? You just got to get the yeah. vibe. That's all that matters. Just like my Jerry Seinfeld impression. That's the key. Mm, yeah. Get the vibe. You knew, <laughs> You know when I'm doing Jerry Seinfeld. It's obvious. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do know, unfortunately. Yes. Anyways, this is for the week of January the 10th to January the 16th. And the first movie that's coming out is coming out on Tuesday, January the 11th, Simon. And it's a movie called Old Strangers. And this is confirmed by Movie Insider on the Apple TV application. It's a video on demand movie. And it's uh, in a post-pandemic world. People are trying to reconnect. That's what this movie's about. Mm. If only we were in post-pandemic times already. But alas. Man, why are they making movies about this? Like, it's kind of torture. I'm not sure I'll ever watch a movie know. like that that states it's in post-pandemic times. Yeah. Yeah. Same. It's like, uh, 
I've always said this, Adrian. I feel like I've said this to you many times. I might have said it even on this podcast, but the worst kinds of dreams, you know what they are, Adrian? They're good dreams. Exactly. Good dreams. Because good dreams are usually things that aren't happening currently in your life and you want to happen. When you wake up, you're snapped into reality and you're like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, you go snap back to reality. Whoop, there goes gravity. Exactly. That's exactly what I say every time I wake up in the morning. It's amazing. I know. You are Eminem. It's wild. Maybe I am. You are the lyricist for his songs. Uh, no comment. Wow. Don Raid is up next and it's confirmed by Movie Insider and the Apple TV app. This is a video on demand documentary about the rise and fall and then rise again of the hip hop record label of the same name. Hmm. Simon, have you ever heard of Don Raid? No. I haven't. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. I was going to make a stupid, yeah. uh, weird joke about my girlfriend, but I just I just couldn't think of it. So, And that's fair. That's fair. Because her name is Dawn. That was the joke. Anyway, continuing. <laughs> Anyways, I'll continue. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was me. I didn't make the mean. joke. That was the reference to the joke. Sorry. It was not clear enough for you. Ooh. Ooh. But yeah, and that Don Raid ride up, I think it says like the legendary hip hop record label. I'm like, I've literally never heard of Don Raid. I've heard of a Don and I've heard of Raid. Redemption. Which is the insect repellent. Oh, not the martial arts movie. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, that movie as well. Raid, Raid Redemption. And I never think of Raid now. It's just Raid Redemption because the martial arts in that oh. is so tight, 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 tight. It's awesome. Just like in Cobra Kai, Simon. Oh, yeah? You're comparing Raid Redemption's choreography, fight choreography, to Cobra Kai? Yeah, man. In which it's there identical. Are, which there are children that you literally said are just doing their own stunts, which is a weird way to describe it. They are. All right. It's surprisingly good, man. It's surprisingly good. You're not selling it too hard. You should watch it if you care. I don't need to sell it too hard. It's incredibly popular. It's already a popular show. You know, I'm if just you don't thinking watch that it, each of don't these... Get, no, 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 just don't get the enjoyment out of it, man. It's fine. It's fine. Don't get the enjoyment out of it? Yeah, get the enjoyment out of watching it. Oh, by watching it. But I haven't watched the other... We've talked about this. I haven't watched the other Karate Kid movies. I've only wa watched one and three or something. What's that? The mm. first one, I've watched the one with uh, Hillary Swank. That's the fourth one, Simon. And the fourth one. Thank you for specifying. Adrian, what's the next yeah. movie coming out, bro? Ooh, it's a movie called The Battle, and it's releasing on Wednesday, January the 12th. Uh, the sequel to Beast. It's confirmed by Cineplex, and it's trailers, and it's coming to theaters here in North America. Now, this movie looks absolutely amazing. It has this beautiful animation style, an interesting premise, and I'm incredibly disappointed I can't see this one uh, because I really wanted to. This trailer actually played before Spider-Man No Way Home. I don't know if you recall, Simon. I don't know if I do. It did. Uh, I just want to let you know it did play. And it's a me-ass type of movie. It's this anime movie. It looks fucking awesome. And uh, again, I really want to watch it. And I, I won't be able to. I'm so sorry to hear that. I won't be able to. Yeah. Why not? Because the theaters are closed, Simon. Oh, yes. We talked about that on, the, that on story one. Yeah. The first story. You really do pay attention to this podcast. I do? Yeah. That was proof right there. Yeah. Proof proof is in the podcast, as they say. Or arguably, you pay attention to, like, you know, walking outside. That, that, that also, because that's our reality. But anyway. Snap back to reality. Whoop, there goes gravity. I'm bringing it back, baby. Never mind. Um, Friday, January 14th. These are the next movies. These are the last movies coming out. Are you ready, Simon? It's rapid fire time. You ready? Yes. Yes, I'm ready. Go. Riverdance, the animated adventure. This is a Netflix original movie about two kids that learn to dance from a reindeer, I believe. The write-up was a little bit unclear. Now, The Tragedy of Macbeth is the next movie. I actually mentioned that this movie was coming out to theaters, which it did. This is surprisingly an Apple TV Plus original movie. Did you know that? Yeah. We literally just saw a trailer for it when we watched The Cursed Pizza and Nightmare Alley, and it says it right in it. Uh, I don't remember. I'll be honest with you. Pretty sure it says that. Anyway. Well, yeah, this is coming out. Wait, why would that surprise you? They have an incredible like quality standard. It surprised me because I didn't know it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a simple man. Surprised by simple things. You going to watch it? Yeah, maybe. It's rated incredibly well. It is black and white, though, and I don't like black and white movies, as you say, so, yeah. I know you're being sarcastic here, but uh, actually, I think you've said that more on this podcast than I have, so. At this point, probably. Maybe it is true. Maybe it's, it's, that's like how you say all the time, I'm so swole, like I, pr trying to be ironic, but you're not really ironic when you say it, you know, 85 times. When have but, I ever said that? You've said it you last recently, but you definitely used to say that a lot, like at least once a week, whenever I would see you. Well, I was pretty swole. 
No big deal. But of course, you never said that to me. You sold that to uh, Jimmy or my girlfriend, to various other people, and the, the message was passed on to me. They would say to me constantly, Adrian said he swole again. Oh, that rascal. And I would be like, yeah, he thinks he's being ironic. But in reality, he's not because he is so swole is what you said out loud. And it, the point is, at some point, you become the thing that you think you're being ironic about. Yeah, like me doing the 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 little, I just did the hand move. I don't know how to explain it. You know, when you hold out your pinky and you hold out your thumb and then you go, you wave it back and forth, kind of like shred the gnar. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah, now I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Really well described. Um, next up is Hotel Transylvania, Transformania movie. This is an Amazon Prime video original movie, Simon. And it's a sequel to the Hotel Transylvania movie. Zzz. I think this is the fourth one or the fifth one. I don't know. I haven't watched any of these. Good. Okay, cool. Our <laughs> Arctic Void is up next. This is confirmed by Movie Insider in the Apple TV app. This is a video on demand movie about the three soul survivors. Uh, I wrote soul as in soul, but it should be the soul as in soul. You know what I'm saying? It's soul survivors of an Arctic cruise that must fight for survival after everyone else on board vanishes, Simon. Mm. Yeah. The Free Fall is up next. It's confirmed by Movie Insider and the Apple TV app. This is a video on demand movie, and it's uh, an a- it's a I'm just gonna read it. After trying to kill herself, a young lady has to wrestle with a husband that is overbearing. Mm. Like in the like the the hit TV show on stars called Heels. Continue. Yes, yes, exactly. I don't know the premise of that show, but that seems right. Um, the Surprise is up next, Simon. It's confirmed by Movie Insider on the Apple TV app. This is a video on demand movie. So, Simon, I uh, I copied and pasted this one. We're not playing the game this week. The, the hit game that everyone loves to listen to where it's which one did I write and which one didn't I write? Or which one did I plagiarize? That, that, that hit segment of our show that we've done many a times. And this one, I just I just read it, and I'm like, I'm very confused as to what this is, and I don't know how to write it up. So I'm just going to read it. Are you ready? Yes. So the surprise. When a young couple makes a surprise visit to mom, they get an even bigger surprise themselves by an old family friend who plans to steal mom's expensive jewelry while she is out of town. But when the easy-peasy robbery goes wrong, resulting in the death of the daughter's husband, it forces the two young drug addicts to make a difficult de- decision. Abandon ship or do the unthinkable. Is it just me or does that make no fucking sense? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it gets confusing at daughter's husband. Yeah, like from that point on, I was like, what? Like, who's the daughter's husband? Who are the two young drug addicts? <laughs> the daughter's... No, no, no. That makes sense. Is it the daughter and the old family friend? The daughter's husband. No, it makes sense. Yeah, no, this makes sense. This makes sense. But when the easy peasy robbery goes wrong, resulting in the death of the daughter's husband, it forces the two young drug addicts to make a difficult decision. Abandon ship or do the Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. It's a robbery gone wrong. It's a robbery gone wrong type situation. It's a sequel to uh, Don't Breathe. Yeah, maybe. No, probably not. I didn't watch the sequel to Don't Breathe. Don't Breathe 2. I haven't either. And I don't plan on watching it anytime soon. Did you watch the original? You didn't even watch the original. I did. I did watch the original. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh. I sure did. It's a good movie. I mean, it's good. It was a good movie. It was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. It made me, um, it made me, um, come. What? <laughs> Why? Why would it do that? It's a scary movie, Adrian. It made me, um, you don't know how to take a, a cue? <laughs> What's the Maybe next not. movie coming out? You. <laughs> it may be um. Come on. Come on, what? It made you come on what? What is the next movie coming out? <laughs> Screams. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Take a hint. Take a cue. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Why would it become? <laughs> Oh my god, that was ridiculous. I'm sorry. It was ridiculous, <laughs> man. You're not on today. You're not on. I'm not sure. You're you're on today. That's all I'm gonna say. You've asked that uh, question before. You're like, I don't feel like I'm on today in terms of comedic timing. And I'm like, I don't know if you're on today. That's the truth. Oh, I'm I'm on today. I'm on today. It took you five minutes to say scream. 
Which is the yeah, next movie coming out to Cineplex, <laughs> but not really. It's good. Confirmed by Cineplex in the trailer. This is coming to theaters. Yeah. But not near us because the theaters are closed. And I think this is the fifth movie in the franchise. Question mark? Don't ask me. I'm going to binge these movies and review them all. I'm going to binge all the Scream movies and then review them all. Yes. That's what I'm going to do. Good old Scream face. Made that commitment. It's not on any uh, streaming service. Scream face the killer. Which is unfortunate. So I might just like rent all of them scream i looked scream scream guy i can try super channel for free hooded scream man the ice the eye scream man that's what they should call the movie no no, no the guy that the killer in is called the scream face right no i think it's ghost face isn't it it is i was hoping you correct me like an hour ago again you're not on today oh geez this is a train wreck of an episode anyways it's like i'm sorry my thing is vibrating again i don't know what's vibrating just hit it let me just give it a good bang we've had like 15 interruptions of this episode probably more honestly stop it i just whacked it a bit just gave it a good whack i'm sorry what did you whack my vent okay just gave it a whack Whatcha? fantastic anyways that's it that's all simon that's it that's all those movies all the screen movies are on um super channel which is i guess a channel i can get through apple tv is that so do you have to pay for it though it's 10 bucks a month which i'm not going to play but there's a free trial so i just got to like commit to watching the four movies within a week which is possible i watched like like five purge movies within like the span of like two days so Right. Scream 4. Adrian, that's the end of our regular scheduled programming. Do you have anything else to say to our audience? I'm pretty tired. I feel like we should wrap this this guy up. Mm. This very strange episode. I mean, um, yeah, like I, I, w- I was disappointed about the theaters closing, but I'm glad that we got to watch a, Debbie, a, a Bradley double feature Cooper. A, a, a double Cooper. A double, a double Bradley Cooper feature. I'm glad we got to do that. So I'm glad we watched a... A uh, Debbie Debbie Bradley Freacher thing as well. Mm-hmm. I don't know who Debbie is, but yeah. Did I say Debbie? <laughs> I don't know. I must have. You did in the beginning, anyway. But yeah, no, it was it was good that we did get to do that, and I feel like that was nice to kind of go to the theater that pre- people didn't probably think to go to, uh, which was like the mm-hmm. Princess Twin theaters, because I mean it wasn't very packed for us there. But no, I do. Um, yeah, I do feel bad about these theaters having to close. But again, there's not much you can do, I think. But do you, what do you think? Do you think they're going to lock down for real? You can say it here. Record it. <sighs> I don't know. I don't want to put that out there. I feel like probably, but... You're right. a superstitious man. I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. Yeah, I set you up for that one. Yeah. But I did also set you up for a couple other jokes, and you kind of just missed the mark. So uh, I, was, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't holding my breath. <sighs> Uh, would have suffocated uh, anyway Adrian <laughs> I'd like to say that uh, audience members if you'd like to write a review about how ridiculous we are you can do that on Apple Podcasts you can write, write a review on Facebook or Twitter we really do appreciate it I really implore you to write a review I feel like there's a few listeners that we definitely know listen to this podcast often that ne- didn't necessarily write a review on Apple Podcasts and it's uh, not – I'm not disappointed. I'm just uh, – I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed is what I'm trying to say. Oh, my goodness. I'm not disappointed. I'm mad. Whoa. So together. We're mad and we're mad disappointed. And disappointed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. That was great. Anyway, if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. But we're also on Spotify, of course, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio. We're everywhere that podcasts are launched typically on an average average week. So if you could listen to us, write a review, subscribe. It does help us quite a bit. Uh, so I'd appreciate that. Of course, we're free. So what's there to lose is what I ask. Anyways, thank you for listening to the 80th episode of Split Focus, the film and TV podcast. My name is Simon Eady, and this is Adrian Pinter signing off. Hey, gang, it is I, Adrian Pinter, and uh, I'm here to just say that um, uh, uh, Batman v Superman is a good movie, and uh, Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon Town is also a good movie, and um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sad theaters are closed and I can't go to Cuba. But you know what? At least I got to talk to you, man. And that's enough. It's enough to keep me going. Me? Yeah, you. Not Penn Badgley. Yeah. It was also nice to go to that uh, Bradley Debbie double feature as well. That was an awesome time. So The double Bra- uh, the double Bradley Cooper feature? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I just said. What do you think I just said? The Debbie Downer. Tuber, Deeper. <laughs> Debbie Downer. <laughs> Bradley feature. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the Bradley something. The Bradley double Cooper feature. 
Yes, Bradley double Cooper. This is a ridiculous. This is supposed to be over. Or the double Bradley the, feature Cooper. Yes. Or the Bradley double feature Cooper. Goodbye. There's so many mixes. Goodbye, audience. I'm going to go sleep now because it's too late for me, apparently, to use my brain. Oh, you little baby. I'm going to tuck you in. I'm living inside your walls. I'll tuck you in while you're sleeping. Take care. Goodbye.